and welcome back to the Where Am I podcast episode 12, the podcast where we explore the world virtually because we cannot do so physically. So last week's episode we were at Sisbury Ring where I gave you to the clues to where we would be this week. Before we get into that, I um, just wanted to make a point of saying that I've made a few more changes to the format. I'm trying to continuously uh, improve the quality um, of the episode, try and make them slightly more visually appealing, uh, make them flow better, and just generally make them a little bit more interesting. Please do let me know what you think, or please do suggest any in improvements you think I could make but please do keep it civil but do let me know in the comments of this video and I also just want to address um, you know several people have asked do I um, have a particular plan uh, for the sites that I visit do I have a particular list of when and where I'm going to visit or where I'm, or what I'm going to include and the honest answer is not really no I have a list of a few places that I want to cover um, but it is kind of random, mainly because I'm trying to find uh, new sites that I don't know about or don't know very much about and explore those and also revisit some favourite sites of mine and cover those as well. But today is very much in the camp of this was a site that I was vaguely aware of but really didn't know that much about. So I was very excited for this episode to find out more, although I have to find it has been quite difficult to find out uh, information about this site. So the um, hopefully the, the podcast won't be too long or rambly today. But let's move on and have a look at the clues I gave you about where I was going to be this week. So we'll start off with a few picture clues. Here we go. So there we've sort of got three images uh, from Google Earth and my own artistic interpretation of one of the features from the site. Um, again, you may have seen some of these clues um, throughout the week on my social media. And here are the clues I gave you in the previous episode. So today I'm at one of the best preserved ancient villages in the southwest of England, inhabited between 500 BC to 400 AD and has a good example of a fugu or an underground stone walled passage, a type of monument only found in the west of Cornwall. So did you manage to guess where I was? If not, or if this is the first time you are seeing these clues, I'll just give you a couple of moments to see if you can guess where I am. Of course, you could also pause the video. In fact, actually, I'll give you one further uh, clue, picture clue. Here we go. So this is how the site might look if you were standing uh, out in it today or in the modern times. Obviously, it'll be very different weather today. And actually, if I reveal the image text now, it will actually tell you I am. And yes, I am at Khan Uni in Cornwall. So let's go through some quick facts then about the site, about Khan Uni. So it's located in Cornwall in the Penrith district close to the village of Sandcreed. It is one of the best preserved prehistoric villages in the southwest of England. It was inhabited from circa 500-400 BC to around 400 AD during the Iron Age and Romano-British periods. It has an excellent example of a fugu. Uh, the site, the site consists of at least 10 houses uh, from the period and the site unfortunately has over time suffered from um, stone robbing so people going on site and taking stones away to build uh, other houses or for um, field boundaries or for whatever reason and also farming has also damaged the site so this makes the layout and the stratigraphy sometimes can be a bit difficult to figure out. So the series of the stratigraphy, the, the layers of activity over the site. Um, and also it may have destroyed parts of the site. So the site may have been larger, may have been more houses, but due to the, that bobbing and destruction due to farming, the evidence doesn't survive really um, through to this day. And the site is overlooked by the Iron Age hill fort of Cabra. Uh, but the exact relationship between the site and the hill fort is, as far as I'm aware, not 
really known, but it is, um, and there's other Iron Age settlements in the area as well. So let's have a quick look through its history, use and phases. So the early evidence for human activity on the site of uh, Ker Uni dates back to around the Neolithic. This is uh, represented really by sort of sparse um, flint tool finds, hand axes and uh, sort of scrapers and other Neolithic um, stone tools, um, but not in a large quantity really to give any more, much more information. Uh, other than that, but the actual first phase of the Iron Age village dates to around between 500 uh, BC to 100 BC. And this um, consisted of a timber built village. So the first houses on the site were built, sorry, pardon me, out of timber. Um, first stone houses were built somewhere between 1000, uh, 1, 100 BC and 50 AD. But the main phase of the, the settlement, the settlement um, or, or the main phase being, you know, the evidence that can still be seen above ground today dates between the second and fourth centuries AD. Um, during this phase, several of the earlier stone houses were replaced by larger courtyard houses for current remains of the site, um, which are still represented today above ground, which can be seen in the image I showed you earlier. So the houses are clustered together in sort of a haphazard interlocking pattern, often sharing um, sort of walls or with walls buttoned up right against each other. Um, field boundaries that were discovered during the excavations and sort of surveying and investigations into the site indicate that the inhabitants of the village uh, farmed an area of around 40 acres around the village and that the inhabitants grew oats, barley, rye and were keeping sheep, goats and probably some cattle as well. And the villagers were likely involved in the trading of tin. Cornwall is a very bit important area for the production of tin. Uh, tin was quite important during the later Iron Age, certainly, um, for bronze to make coinage. And also bronze was still being used to make uh, decorative um, and ornamental pieces. The village, though, uh, the Iron Age village was abandoned around about 400 AD for an unknown reason. There doesn't seem to be really any evidence of any catastrophic event which may give an uh, indication of why it was abandoned. Um, such as, you know, a, a major conflict um, or fire or natural disaster. There's no evidence of that. However, there may have been the fear of conflict or the con or conflict which just hasn't left any evidence. Um, or it could be um, gradual decline over time and the area just didn't become um, as profitable and maybe move into some of the other Iron Age settlements in the local area. Or it was potentially abandoned due to uh, the wider political climate and upheaval that was experienced or that accompanied the decline of the Mono-British uh, the Romano British period and the eventual decline of the Western Roman Empire. Then the site was uninhabited for about a thousand years, um, going into the post medieval period, where the ruins um, appear to be used as pigsties and garden plots, and again, unfortunately, probably likely damaged stones, robbed out, moved, or just completely removed from the site altogether. And a small cottage was also built on the site. Um, uh, in the mid 18th century, but only appears to be used in uh, up until the mid 19th century and then fell into disuse. So again, there's a very quick history um, of the site and looking at its different phases. And here are some pictures which sort of highlight the sort of layout of the village. So in that slightly haphazard and sort of bunching of the houses that can be seen in the left hand image here with these two houses button up here and the one underneath also button up there. Um, and again, the second uh, image there, the middle image is just showing that in a bit more detail. And then the final image is showing that a sort of a more secluded set away um, house, probably from slightly earlier Iron Age phase, one of these oval, single oval, um, 
or circular uh, stone buildings. So let's now have a look at the houses in a bit more detail. So as we mentioned, nothing remains from the earliest phases of the house at Khan Uni, um, as the first phase phases were of timber constructions and these do not survive well in the archaeological record um, apart from in generally waterlogged contexts. The first stone houses were built between 100 BC and 50 AD and they were often built in the plans or we think were built in the plans of the earlier houses. Uh, these were often a single roomed uh, oval or round houses. These were then were replaced by the courtyard houses uh, between 200 and 400 AD. These courtyard houses are again a style which are only really found in Cornwall. They were usually oval or circular in plan with thick inter interlinking walls surrounding a large central courtyard with smaller round and long rooms located within the thickness of the outer wall, so protecting those um, smaller rooms. What these smaller rooms for? Um, we don't really know. Again, they may be a view being used for storage areas or for um, maybe for stabling or for keeping of animals. The courtyards uh, were drained by stone lined gullies to stop the um, buildings from flooding. And again, they may have been used um, for stabling of animals, crop processing and outdoor cooking as well. So again, just a very brief look at the houses. Uh, but I really want to move on to the main sort of feature that really interests me at Khan Uni. Here, the image on the, the uh, left hand side of the screen is my artistic interpretation of the fugu or that underground chamber which we alluded to earlier on and this image coming in now on the right hand side of the screen uh, is a view going out from the fugu at Carnuni from inside looking out towards the village so again here's my artistic interpretation which is uh, based off the um, Fugu from Khan Uni based off descriptions and pictures. So what generally, what are Fugus? So as mentioned, a Fugu um, is a underground dry stone chamber found in the Iron Age and Romano British settlements in Cornwall. Uh, the term Fugu potentially comes from Cornish Ugo meaning cave and one can definitely understand why it may be given that name. Colloquially, they've been known by a variety of other names, such as Vargs, Vows, Foggos, Giant Holes, and so forth. They are very similar to the souterrains or earth houses of Northern Europe, especially uh, those of Scotland, uh, which also includes the ones which have been found on Orkney. Fugus consist of a buried, of a buried corbelled stone wall which tapers towards the top which is then capped by stone slabs. They were usually constructed by the excavating or excavation of a sloping trench um, usually about uh, five foot deep by about six foot wide. Um, this was then lined with the dry stone walls and then capped by slabs and often with the excavated earth then dumped on over the top. Now, the exact purposes of these um, of these monuments or these buildings aren't really known. And this is the bit which sort of really interests me. Various theories have been put forward, um, including being refu uh, refuges in times of conflict, food storage, drying and curing meats or sites of, of ritual significance and activity. But did they just have one purpose? I think it's often we get um, too fixated on things having particular purposes, maybe to consider, we should consider the fact that maybe these had more than one purpose, or in fact that just because they were built for one purpose, they were also used for other purposes. And just because they were used for one thing at one site, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were used um, for a different purpose at another site. Um, we are certainly uh, a lot of Iron Age literature is exploring um, hill forts and how different hill forts in a landscape may have had particular functions. 
Um, and because obviously there's that long age debate about what hill forts were also used for. And again, these fugus, um, the case of the, certainly the one at Khan Uni, we'll talk about in a moment in a bit more detail, um, was changed over time. Other passages were put in. So again, over time, its use may have changed. So all of those could be right. None of those could be right. Do you have any ideas about what they might be? Please, again, let me know in the comments, especially if you've looked into this in more detail um, than I have. Or um, if you've excavated one, please let me know. Please let me know what you found out. I'll be very interested in knowing that. So let's look a bit more in detail at the Fugu at Khan Uni. So um, the picture on the screen there is a engraving uh, or sketch which was made during W.C. Uh, or Balassi's um, excavations of the interior of the um, Fugu at Khan Uni. So at, on the top of the image, you can see the uh, stone slabs which make up the roof. And here are on the sides here are the um, corbelled stone passageways sort of tapering towards the top, which then sort of curves round this uh, sort of uh, snake like corridor into a large just central chamber with what appears to be a little recess at the back there. So Fugu at Kern only comprises of an underground chamber, which is sort of beehive like in construction and shape with a serpentine shape entrance passage. At the back, there is a niche which may indicate it. This was a place for ritual activity, such as deposits for particular objects. Uh, during the excavations, uh, sherds of highly decorated pottery were discovered in the Fugu. Again, this may support the case of ritual uh, deposits or for ritual activity, as these highly decorated rare wares were often associated with ritual activity on other Iron Age sites. Um, and again, the Fugu does appear to undergo changes over time with other passages being added and other entranceways being added over the period. There's actually a very good um, image of this or, or layout map of this on uh, English Heritage's uh, website, which I'll link in the description of this video. Do go and check it out and that will give you the different phases of building of the Fugu. So at the discovery and excavations of the site, um, the site was sort of rediscovered back in the 1840s uh, with miners who were uh, prospecting for tin, actually digging down, prospecting, and they actually found the fugu. But this was not actually excavated until uh, the 1860s by the Cornish antiquarian W.C. Borlacy, who made that engraving and image of the fugu that we looked at on the previous slide, or commissioned it actually. Um, in the 1920s, uh, Dr. Favell and Canon Tyler discovered some of the foundation walls of the houses, uh, the courtyard houses. But the first sort of um, main excavations did not take place until the 1960s and 70s, where between 1964 and then 1972, a series of excavations were carried out, which identified nine hut foundations. The, again, they rediscovered and Fugu, which was um, reinvestigated and restored. And they identified four main occupation phases between the 5th or 6th centuries BC to 4 centuries AD. Um, so that really actually brings us to the end of the uh, looking at Khan Uni. As I said, it is a bit of a shorter video. It was a bit more difficult to find out information um, or find out information which didn't criticise other information. Um, so I did try and give a very brief overview. Again, I'll link some of the further information to the um, sources and references that are used for this video um, for if you wanted to go and find out anything more. And again, if you have if you visited or you have any stories about um, Khan Uni or any more information about Fugus, again, please do let me know. I do these podcasts for mainly for me to learn more 
um, and, and, to, and to find out more things that I didn't know previously. But what I think about what's really interesting about Carnooney, I think, is, you know, these sort of unusual courtyard houses and these fugues which only really appear in Cornwall. Of course, lots of different areas of um, Britain and Europe and, and other countries do have regional variations of um, sort of how way, ways of building houses and particular monuments, but as well as a lot of continuity. You know, there's a hill fort near Carnoon, you know, are discovered all the way across um, Britain and bits of Northern Europe, such as Sisbury Ring that we looked at last week. Um, so again, it is quite it's, it's a very interesting site to look at, even with the limited information I've been able to find out. I hope this um, has been interesting for you as well. So let's move on to have a look at where I'll be in the next episode. So I will give you your clues. I'll be at a site that is renowned for its cave paintings and it's probably one of the most famous sites known for its cave paintings. It was rediscovered in 1940 by an 18-year-old uh, and his dog when his dog fell into a hole. And due to the popularity of people visiting the site, um, it actually had, the site actually had to be closed off to the public in 1963 and a series of sort of replica sites and museums to be set up um, so people could still enjoy the site. So there are your clues. And there's a challenge. Can you guess where I am? As always, keep out for further clues on my Facebook and Instagram and Twitter pages throughout the week. I'd like to thank you very much for tuning in to today's episode. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening.